Welcome back to the uh, the Artificial Intelligence True Quality Summit series. Please join me in welcoming Naomi Schwartz, the Vice President at MedCrypt. Naomi will be leading us in a session titled Cybersecurity and the AI ML or and AI ML are inextricably linked when dealing with the FDA. The session will run for about 35 minutes with about 10 minutes allotted for questions at the end. If any questions come up throughout the presentation, please ask in the Q&A on the uh, next to the chat and we'll try to get through as many as possible. Naomi, thank you for being with us today. The floor is yours. Hi, um, I am Naomi Schwartz. I'm the Vice President of Services at MedCrypt. We are a medical device cybersecurity specialty firm. Um, I personally am a former uh, pre-market reviewer and consumer safety officer from CDRH. I was there for six and a half years focusing on software interoperability, cybersecurity, and wireless coexistence for connected diabetes devices, which is one of the more complicated spaces that FDA regulates where there's a lot of connectivity and a lot of concern, legitimate concern about cybersecurity. Um, previously, I was a defense contractor for 15 years developing radar systems and jammers for field tests with operational DOD assets. So when I think about uh, cybersecurity and the, the triad of confidentiality, integrity, availability, my primary job for 15 years was to disrupt the availability of systems using uh, uh, electromagnetic um, interference effectively. And so I come at all of the cybersecurity conversations from a particular direction that is a little bit unusual, but I like to uh, emphasize to people that it is um, part of the overall space that you have to think about. And it's going to be very important for people to design devices to stand up to people like me um, who find it interesting and fun to, um, to test out your systems. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the agenda. What has FDA said about AI and machine learning publicly? Um, and what ways does a device using AI and machine learning differ from one that does not? And, and in what ways are they alike, especially about cybersecurity? What additional information do you need to share with FDA to demonstrate security now that they have statutory authority to expect security in addition to your typical documentation regarding um, you know, safety and effectiveness regarding substantial equivalence. If you have a 510K, you now have a triad, safety, effectiveness, and security that you have to describe to the FDA. How do you convince FDA you've evaluated the additional risks related specifically to the use of AI ML, but also related to cybersecurity focused on the AI and machine learning aspects of your device? How can I get cleared? How can I get cleared or approved for a new device that incorporates AI or machine learning into it and has to maintain cybersecurity? And I'll give a brief history of AI ML regulation at FDA because it's really interesting and it's changing dramatically. There's a lot of exciting stuff happening. So um, what has FDA said publicly? FDA has an entire website dedicated to AI and machine learning enabled medical devices. There have been some updates um, there are 171 new AI ML enabled devices that were added um, to this list on their website um, since October of 2022. Um, there's a spreadsheet available at that site that is up to date as of a few weeks ago, including almost 700 final decisions, two of which occurred prior to the year 2000, which I found fascinating because it didn't occur to me that this was actually taking place that early. There are a number of devices regulated across a, a fairly wide variety of groups, but with the predominance in radiology. And you can see I've put strike through in some of these numbers. Um, that is because those have changed in the past year and mm, a few months. Um, there are new anesthesiology and cardiovascular devices. There are new ear, nose, throat devices. There are new devices in gastroenterology and urology. There's a new device in immunology. There are new devices in neurology and ophthalmic. And of course, the big one, there are a lot of new devices in radiology. So you can see that not only are there a lot of new devices, but that companies are coming in with innovation in different spaces. And they're really expanding the uh, availability of 
um, innovation across different indications for use and different areas of medicine, which is fantastic because it means patients are going to get better results, hopefully faster, and start getting resolution of medical conditions in a way that um, is relieving because these things are ten, uh, tend to be pretty stressful for the patients. There's another site um, on FDA's website dedicated to AI and machine learning in software as a medical device specifically. So not just the SIMDs, um, but now also specifically SAMDs. And there are a number of software as a medical device issues that are highlighted. Um, so FDA has issued a, uh, an action plan to address uh, several questions. What is AI and ML? How are these devices um, learning uh, devices transforming the medical device ecosystem. They're, they are having a tremendous impact, to be specific. Um, how is FDA considering regulation of these devices? Um, modifications might require pre-market review. Predetermined change control may optimize that. FDA expects a commitment from manufacturers about transparency and about real world performance monitoring, as well as the updates that are needed um, and, and changes that are implemented. AI and machine learning uh, news um, and updates that are issued periodically by FDA. FDA wants to encourage manufacturers to talk about what is changing in this space and they want to encourage stakeholders the healthcare professionals, the patients, the advocacy groups, uh, the caregivers to actively talk about their concerns, um, any problems they're having, innovation that they'd like to see, um, because it's important, right? That That is CDRH's primary mission is to support public health. And that means having conversations about it. There is a lot of um, interesting discussion on the internet today about AI and machine learning. And there's some, in my opinion, hyperbole. And we want to make sure that patients feel comfortable and safe and confident about these kinds of um, changes that are occurring in the medical space so that they're not afraid of the change, um, so that they're not afraid of having new devices used in the management of their conditions. And so that doctors are not overwhelmed with these questions and trying to figure out how to answer them. That's really hard for physicians because they have a particular role to play and they're being asked to referee about technology in some cases about which they know nothing. Um, and we wanna make sure we, um, MedCrypt, but we, the entire community, wanna make sure we're communicating clearly and transparently with the public about what these changes mean for patients, hopefully all positive, um, but, but we wanna make sure that we have a good story for people so that everyone understands what the intention is um, and that you know we're, we're not talking about Skynet um, for those who are Terminator fans. So what else is FDA saying publicly about AI and ML? Uh, there's a draft guidance issued on April 3rd of this year about marketing submission recommendations for predetermined change control plan for AI or machine learning enabled devices, um, software functions. That's a mouthful and, and then some, but they're asking for public comment on the proposed uh, discussion about developing predetermined change control plans for AI or machine learning enabled device software functions. They're not talking about PCCP outside of that space because this is the space where it has a huge impact on manufacturers plans and on FDA review of devices that potentially could change rapidly and could, in some cases, evolve dynamically once they are sent to market. Um, so it's gonna be absolutely essential for everyone who has an interest in this area to review that draft guidance and to provide feedback in the public comment period, or even outside of the public comment period. FDA still considers comments um, at some point if they come outside of the comment period, but it's really critical that people take the time to review these guidance documents as they're issued in draft and go and look at them and think, you know, is this going to make my life harder? Is this going to make my life easier? Do I need clarification? It's really critical. FDA would like to hear your perspectives. Um, it's not just an exercise in, oh, we have to do this, which it also is. 
Um, but FDA needs to hear feedback. If you don't provide feedback and you have hard feelings afterward when there's a final guidance that doesn't look like something you can follow, um, you have no one but yourself to blame. Um, this, the same thing was true with cybersecurity. There was a huge amount of um, industry feedback and public feedback about it. A lot of um, diabetes stakeholders gave feedback about cybersecurity and FDA took it very, very seriously. I know because I was still um, at the agency when that public comment was being reviewed. And it's just so helpful to the agency to hear your perspectives. Um, in January of 21, FDA issued an action plan in response to public feedback received about their artificial intelligence machine learning based software as a medical device action plan. Um, and in February of 2020, they held a public workshop evolving the role of artificial intelligence in radiological imaging. Obviously, that is the most common space where AI or ML are included in devices today. But I think over time, we'll see a shift to um, that taking a less large proportion of medical devices that are on market containing AI or ML. Um, FDA has issued previous discussion papers in April of 2019. There are collaborative communities. Um, in April 2019, there was also a commissioner's statement um, talking about how to tailor the review framework for AI or machine learning enabled devices. Um, and that's critical because FDA has to innovate in a regulatory fashion to keep up with medical device innovation. Um, in July 2017, there was an FDA Voices article issued about new steps to empower consumers and to advance digital healthcare. All of these things tie back together. It is a holistic approach that FDA is trying to take to make it easier for manufacturers, easier for physicians, easier for patients to understand the space and to utilize the space. Um, so all of these hyperlinks, uh, these underlined uh, pieces in here are hyperlinked in the presentation and, um, and we will share that after um, after the, the conference has ended so that you have access to this information. But I like to make it super easy for you to find all of the things I talk about and not just make you go do some homework in, um, in Google searching after the fact. Um, what else has FDA said about AI and machine learning publicly? Well, most of it has been about predetermined change control. Um, they have that draft guidance. Um, they're talking about a PCCP. They define it as a plan that includes device modifications that would otherwise require a pre-market approval supplement, PMA supplement, or a de novo submission um, if you have a new indication for use um, and, and potentially don't need a PMA uh, or a new pre-market notification. If you have a device in mind and you don't know whether it should be a PMA or a de novo or a pre-market notification, you should talk to FDA. You should reach out to them and ask for what's called the 513G, um, a, a determination of what the pathway should be, and FDA can help you identify that. But if you submit one of those types of pre-market submissions to FDA with AI or machine learning enabled functions, and you include a predetermined change control plan, FDA has to review it now. Um, they can review it and establish through the device marketing authorization, through clearance or approval or a de novo granting. Um, and if they do that, the PCCP itself becomes referred to as an authorized predetermined change control plan. It becomes part of your clearance or approval. It will be mentioned in the decision summaries. It is publicly acknowledged that your device includes a predetermined change control plan. And that allows you to proactively pre-specify uh, with authorization uh, a certain subset of intended modifications and the method you'll implement them for AI or machine learning without needing to have additional marketing submissions. Let me pause there and emphasize how important that is, because that means that you can make changes based on the way you outlined you would make the changes, based on the types of changes you outlined, and based on the metrics that you apply for acceptance without resubmitting to FDA. You, of course, have to maintain all of the design history files and all of the change documentation, but you don't need to resubmit to FDA. That also means you don't have the additional timeline of FDA review. Um, you don't have the additional timeline of interactive questions or hold letters or 
any of those details. It just means you have to have a really solid quality system behind the scenes that supports all of these changes and keeping track of them. But that's great because it means you don't need to pay for a submission, wait for a submission. Um, you can make the changes as long as they're consistent with your PCCP. It is also great because it means FDA reviewers don't need to review all of the changes. If you have a class three device and a pre-market approval, you don't need as many PMA supplements. That is fantastic for both you and your review team. They will be delighted to not have 35 PMA supplements in a given year because you're making some changes to your AI or your machine learning enabled um, software functions in a device. Um, as a former reviewer, I will tell you, I'm not kidding, they will be delighted to not have lots of PMA supplements and your reg affairs team will be really, really happy to. Um, but that's a draft guidance, which means that it is FDA's general thinking about something, but it's not implemented. It is not a set of recommendations that they can tell you to follow. It is a set of recommendations that you can choose to follow if you desire. Um, so draft guidance is, is not official policy and it's not statutory requirements. Um, it, it is primarily focused on AI and ML though. And I would like to emphasize that predetermined change control plans don't only apply or need not only apply to AI and machine learning. The guidance just doesn't address those other issues. Um, it, it's, it's really focused on the AI and machine learning enabled devices. So there's also statutory authority now for FDA to consider PCCP. Um, we'll talk more about that later, but it happened in the same appropriations bill as the cybersecurity authority that came through section 524B of the act. And it's, it's something that gets, I think, a little less attention because cybersecurity was such a big deal. So um, what about a device that uses AI ML? And, and how does it compare to one that does not? <clears throat> there are a lot of software devices on the market that have um, heuristics or algorithms that are not machine learning that look a lot like devices that come to market that include machine learning um, or, or true artificial intelligence. Um, an AI ML device might be static or it might be dynamically learning. Um, that might be a little bit different than some of the other traditional medical devices in the space. Uh, most medical devices currently using AI or ML don't adapt continuously over their lifespan, um, but some may uh, be able to do so. And FDA understands how to review those. And they have uh, a core group of experts who are doing that. And that will be a space where they're going to have to grow more experts or hire more experts, um, because there are going to be a lot of questions about how to do this and how to do it right. These devices may be biased by study design, um, just as any other medical device could be. Um, but algorithms can be biased by changes made to training or validation data sets, um, which can occur truly with any other medical device um, where data is collected during clinical trials. Um, for a continuously learning algorithm, this could occur if there's inadequate oversight and it could cause immediate harm. So this is one of the spaces where your risk management framework needs to be extremely mature, very well documented, clearly explained. Um, it, in some cases, I think not only adding pros and some graphics um, to your submission, but, but giving a decision tree and showing how you make decisions about the risk is going to be very helpful in conveying this information to FDA because there, there is um, a lot of concern about oversight um, and the potential for harm based on software that can change dynamically um, with real world data flowing into it. And AI and machine learning devices may benefit enormously from real world performance data, uh, but you have to have strict monitoring of that data to ensure um, that you as a manufacturer know how your product is going to be used, um, that you're monitoring it, that you're capable of identifying improvements rapidly, but also if something comes up that doesn't look right, that you are paying attention to it, reacting to signals that you've really comprehensively talked about what signals you might be looking for, um, and that you have a mechanism to proactively respond either to a safety concern or a usability concern or emphatically a cybersecurity concern. If you see something that doesn't look right, you should immediately 
start to evaluate it. And you should have a really solid incident response plan for AI and machine learning enabled devices. It's going to be critical. Um, in that space, review branches have some flexibility in how they consider software changes in medical devices. This is true for a uh, typical SIMD or SAMD. It's also true for AI or machine learning enabled devices. But the regulatory science needs to evolve to accommodate the, the pace of change um, that we're going to see with these enabled devices because the regulatory science is always evolving um, and playing catch up. Um, with changes in the device space and in cybersecurity as well as AIML, sometimes these changes are happening faster than the regulator is, is prepared to react. Sometimes there are resourcing issues. We know that there are not adequate cybersecurity professionals to support the entire industry given the new mandates from FDA. We, we similarly know that FDA is resource constrained as well and that FDA will be working to make sure that they have the right staff to review these kinds of devices, to ask the right risk questions. So if you have questions or concerns about, you know, how a review is going to go for a future device, you should make sure to talk to FDA uh, as early and as often as you can through pre-submissions, asking very specific questions and making sure that you understand FDA's expectations of you and that you're providing FDA with a preview of a complex system that they are going to have to review in the future. It's really great to give them a heads up about timeline because that can help them plan their resources accordingly as well. Um, there are also new questions relating to patient privacy and the patient healthcare provider trust associated with these devices. You need to have a good story on cybersecurity because that can only support a more positive view. Um, transparency to the users is gonna be critical in obtaining and maintaining the trust. Um, and it's, it's gonna be critical in informed consent as well. Um, and that relates back to cybersecurity too, because you need to tell patients what data you're collecting through your devices, how you're going to use it, give them confidence that their personal information is not going to become available, um, that their genome data is not going to become available on the dark web or on the open internet somewhere to, to give them confidence that, um, that the data that you collect that you use to help them manage their healthcare condition is not going to be later used to harm them in some other way, whether it's a direct physical harm or a psychological harm or a financial harm, you don't want patients to worry about harm of those types. So where does that bring us with respect to cybersecurity? Um, what, what, what new things uh, do we know about cybersecurity with respect to AI ML? Um, the good news is, is that FDA is really encouraging the development and the harmonization of what are called good machine learning practices or GMLPs. Um, FDA loves a good acronym coming out of DOD, I do too, um, but we start to get soupy with all of these letters. GMLP is really a description of a set of best practices. So data management, feature extraction, training, how you interpret data, how you evaluate it and how you document it, which are largely akin to the good software engineering practices that should be in place for SAMD or SIMD anyway, and typically good quality system practices as well. Um, one catch is that a lot of manufacturers are still figuring out how to incorporate cybersecurity documentation into their quality system practices. And that is absolutely crucial. Your root cause analyses, your complaint handling, they should all point back to parallel activities under cybersecurity. Uh, they don't need an entire dissertation written, but your complaint handling process should tell somebody, hey, if I think there might be a cybersecurity event, there is a parallel set of documents that say, what is cybersecurity incident response? How do we determine if we have an event or an incident? What does it mean and who do I call? Um, FDA is really committed to ensuring that cybersecurity is managed robustly for all medical devices. And it's particularly important with AI and machine learning. Um, and so these GMLP efforts that are underway will be pursued in close collaboration with the FDA cybersecurity program. The harmonization activities are absolutely essential though for innovation because of 
all of the different international regulators that a manufacturer has to consider. And FDA does not want to be uh, taking you in a vastly different direction from the rest of the world and creating um, havoc in terms of expectations. They want to be consistent with other groups. They want the UK and Canada and Europe and East Asia, who are all very active in the regulatory space to have a general agreement about expectations um, so that there's confidence in the regulators themselves. What additional information do I need to demonstrate if I'm coming to market with a device that incorporates AI and machine learning? Technically, there's nothing called out in the guidance that says there's additional information that's needed. Why is that? Well, because in reality, whether you have software as a medical device with or without AI and machine learning, you still have to achieve the same set of security objectives. You still need to cover authenticity, which includes integrity, authorization, availability, confidentiality, and you have to have secure and timely patching of your system. It does not matter if there's AI or machine learning in the system or not. If you have a cyber device per uh, Section 524B of the Act, you have to cover these security objectives regardless. They also talk about this in the same vein as cloud-based services for a reason, is because this is an innovative space and there's a lot of new cloud connectivity in medical devices today, and the same security objectives have to be covered, whether or not there's AI and machine learning. Obviously, when there's AI and machine learning, there's additional elements to that that need to be considered in the risk management, but there are no additional major objectives to consider. So the, the pre-market guidance, which is now final, is very clear on this. There's nothing special here. It's just your risk analyses need to be taken to a higher level because the, the risks associated with cybersecurity in these spaces might be a little bit different in scale. Um, FDA's focus is on making sure that this scales properly though. So data validation in this domain is really the critical aspect that we need to talk about. Um, we're really focused on demonstrating um, an assurance of data protection from the start, ensuring that there's trust, um, ensuring that the data processed by the machine learning systems is trusted and protecting the data from its inception implementing asymmetric cryptography, aka PKI, into the data flow process at the creation stage is vital. While the data that remains unsigned isn't necessarily devoid of integrity, signing it as early as possible significantly enhances its security and its trustworthiness. So this approach, if you follow it, enables AI or machine learning systems to validate the data that's coming from a trusted source whether it's a sensor system, a body-worn system, a hospital-based system, um, by verifying its digital signature and its hash. Um, you need to utilize up-to-date hashing algorithms. So the final guidance is very specific about not using deprecated or obsolete algorithms in cryptography. This is so, so important. Um, manufacturers who go to FDA today and cite deprecated hashing algorithms or deprecated cryptography or deprecated cipher suites will see deficiencies. They will see um, interactive review questions, deficiencies, and potentially an NSC decision for a 510K if they're using deprecated algorithms. Obviously, you can go look at your NIST special publications to make sure that what you're using is not deprecated. Those get updated as new findings occur, uh, but you need to use contemporary algorithms because they are validated and because they're going to be continuously evaluated. And of course, we have to worry about post-quantum crypto at some point, but today you should be focused on what we know today. Um, with the eye on future-proofing your system in a way that if something happens tomorrow, you're ready to figure out how to migrate to a different algorithm as needed. The benefits of trusted public keys in AI and machine learning systems really stem from the larger set of benefits that would be true for any other device. Um, by providing a system with public keys from trusted certificate authorities, you gain the capacity to reject untrusted data. That's super important, um, whether it's unsigned or it has an invalid signature. You want to be able to say, whoa, I don't trust this data. 
I don't want to ingest it into my system. And I definitely don't want to retrain or validate my system with this invalid data. I want to get rid of that data set. I want to put it in quarantine. I want to go evaluate it, but I don't want it feeding into my system and creating changes. That's not just about rejecting untrusted data. It's also about enabling your system to verify authenticity of the data source and its integrity, ensuring that only validated and trustworthy data is processed. That is really the key. That's the big discriminator. Um, so how do I convince FDA that I've evaluated all these additional risks? What, what, is, what, what is the necessary documentation? Well, you need to demonstrate a reasonable assurance of both safety and effectiveness now and security. You need to talk about your security risk management deeply. Um, it goes beyond 21 CFR 82030A requiring that all devices established with uh, automation with software have design controls. It, it goes toward what FDA refers to as an optional framework in their final guidance, and that's a secure product development framework. So what is that? Um, it is a set of processes that help you identify and reduce the number and the severity of vulnerabilities in your products. It encompasses all of the aspects of the product's life cycle from design all the way to operations and maintenance, support, and importantly, decommissioning. You will at some point decommission your device because you've spun a new version of it and you want that to be in hand on market. So how can you use this? You can integrate it into your typical quality system, into your risk management framework at large. How do you get yourself approved? Um, how do you get yourself cleared to market or approved? Most important thing you can do is talk to FDA. Have pre-submissions, ask the questions, and maybe even talk about a predetermined change control plan. You need to prominently identify AI and machine learning aspects and the cybersecurity in your cover letter and your executive summary. If it's in there, you'd better be really upfront about it. You need to clearly indicate your rationale for your risk evaluation. It really helps to diagram your logical flow in this space. FDA has cleared or approved a lot of devices since 1995. There are so many really fascinating devices in the marketplace today. Um, I've given you some examples here. I've linked to some things. We, we even have seen one decision summary that's public. Um, that includes a PCCP today. So that's really exciting. That's the de novo 190040. Um, and the slide deck will explain in more detail what that's for. But the de novo is granted in its decision summary with a predetermined change control plan, um, which you can read about later. But the important thing here is they clear they they clarified exactly what kinds of changes they'll make, what kinds of test methods they will have, what their acceptance criteria were. Uh, assessment metrics, and statistical methods that are described. That's what you need to do to get to market. You can take a look at that as an example, um, but that's the new thing in AI and machine learning is, is a predetermined change control plan. And in this case, they had special controls that were included uh, focusing on design verification and validation. So that is absolutely the most essential component for you. You can review these later, but FDA now has statutory authority. Section 515C of the Act gave them the authority to consider a predetermined change control plan. In the past, it was vaguely considered possible, um, but it wasn't clear that FDA had the authority. And when it's not clear, sometimes that leads to legal questions and pushback on FDA, lawsuits going to court, and occasionally things falling apart for the submitter or for the FDA in terms of whether or not they're allowed to do certain things. So now they have clear statutory authority about predetermined change control plans. Um, per that amendment, there are very specific requirements about what PCCP can be uh, used for. It cannot the, the changes made under PCCP cannot be used as a predicate. The original 510K can be, but the changes made, which are not transparent to the public, cannot be used as a predicate. So those are the big um, outstanding areas in AI and machine learning and cybersecurity. Um, I would love to take some questions now. 
Um, so there's only one question in the Q&A right now, um, and it's, will any change in the PCCP affect those aspects that were not mentioned in the change? That's a really great question. If you change your predetermined change control plan, you need to get it reauthorized. Um, so FDA will only consider acceptable modifications without resubmission that occur under the original authorized PCCP. If you discover that there are types of changes that you need to include, or if you discover that there are changes in the metrics or the test methodologies, you need to update your PCCP to reflect that and FDA needs to re-review it. You should do that under the auspices of a change in your device that requires a new uh, 510K or PMA review so that it can be authorized as part of that change and become an FDA authorized PCCP um, as an update. That is absolutely essential. If you make a change to your PCCP plan, it is not authorized until FDA has reviewed it. And I'm not entirely sure what they're gonna do if somebody says I'm changing my PCCP, but I haven't made a change to my device. Uh, that is one of those things that we will need to see how they react to it if, uh, if the public asks those questions. Um, and, and you should, you should reach out and ask them questions about PCCP in AI and machine learning um, because they have that opening for uh, public feedback today. Okay, there's a follow-up to that question and it's um, how many updates in a PCCP are allowed? Uh, I don't think that there's a limit. You need to be very specific about the types of changes that you could make and the types of uh, criteria that you will use for validation, the methods that you will use, but I do not believe that there is a limitation on how many different types of modifications you could make. And to be very specific, that can include an indication for use change under a PCCP, which is really exciting because it is a shift in the regulatory paradigm. It is a dramatic shift. And when I saw it, I first thought, how could that actually work? And then I realized if you're very clear about how it could work, you could also have very, very specific criteria for validating it. All of the methodology could be pretty specific and you could have really specific uh, assessment criteria, but you need to think very carefully about that because this is one of those things that is just extremely detailed and FDA could clear or approve your device, but deny your PCCP during a submission. All right, next question. In the cybersecurity guidance, FDA wants manufacturers to present SBOMs, not just to the FDA, but to end users. How should the manufacturers handle this for AI ML devices where the algorithm may frequently change, especially if there is a PCCP? So that, that's another really great question. Um, there are times where I think software bill of materials probably should not be presented to end users. Um, home use devices, I really would question for you what a person with diabetes is going to do with the software bill of materials for a, uh, on a, an automated insulin dosing system or a continuous glucose monitoring system um, or just a plain old insulin pump. Really, you know, what are they going to do with the software bill of materials? Um, but if you have a hospital system, your hospital engineers probably do need to have that software bill of materials. What are you going to do about it if you have a system that may be changing, that may actually have a change in its software bill of materials? Um, I think the best answer to that is to have a portal through which your customers can access the software bill of materials where you're authenticating and authorizing said customers and their access to that data and constraining uh, their, their use of that data because quite frankly, I do not think anyone will benefit from their software bill of materials being posted on the internet. Um, I, I don't think that these things need to be completely open kimono and shared with everybody in the world. I think we need to be careful about that. Um, it, it just makes the whole attack space so much easier if everybody knows all the things in your system. That's not to say that you're, you're implementing security through obscurity, but you're just being careful about your intellectual property and, and how you manage a crucial part of your overall cybersecurity posture through SBOM. Um, so how should you handle it? You should talk to FDA about what's the right way to handle it. Um, but under a PCCP, part of what you need to maintain is probably your software bill of materials. 
and your vulnerability management plan associated with that software bill of materials. Awesome, thank you. Uh, next question, if you submit under 510K and make a change integrating PCCP, does that remove your product from citation as predicate, even though its original clearance was not PCCP? If you submit under 510K and make a change that integrates PCCP, your new 510K becomes a new potential predicate. Um, does that remove your product from citation as a predicate, even though its original clearance was not PCCP? No, you have a new device and it now has an authorized PCCP. And it can be a predicate because obviously the decision summary and all of the um, all of the documentation associated with it provides some transparency and FDA knows exactly what you have done in that filing. It is the subsequent changes to the, the device under the PCCP that don't get reviewed by FDA because they're under an authorized PCCP that can't be cited as predicates. So the original predicate that had no PCCP can still be a predicate. It can be your predicate. Uh, the new device, including a PCCP that gets authorized, can be a predicate, but the changes made to it under the PCCP are the ones that are restricted from becoming a predicate because there's no transparency about, uh, about it and FDA didn't review it. And, and so they can't tell anybody, you know, what were the changes uh, made and, and what does it entail. If you submit a new 510K with a new PCCP that's changed from that original one, that can become a new predicate, but subsequent changes under PCCP are also barred. Okay, um, I think there's one, we have time for one last question and it's more of a, um, a, a question related to um, resources and it, people are asking if they can get a list of the links from your presentation as well as to the studies mentioned. Absolutely, we, we will share the entire presentation um, at the end of the activity and the presentation itself will come with live links. All of the links that you see in here could be clicked on live during this conversation and they will take you to the resources. It's really intentional to, to make it easier for you to dig into the space and learn about things rather quickly. And I highly encourage you all to go look at that FDA webpage that lists out all of these devices that have been cleared or approved with AI and machine learning. You can actually download an entire spreadsheet through that page that lets you look at everything and sort the data and look at you know what, what panel is it? What review group did it come through? Um, and then you can go look it up in the FDA's 510K database or the de novo database or the PMA database to get more information and to see how much information FDA has shared publicly through their decision summaries so that you can see how much you know information you can glean. Um, I also encourage people to go out and just look at, you know, publicly available labeling that is provided for some of these devices, because that can help inform you on a bare minimum of what you'll have to include. But keep in mind, anything that was cleared or approved prior to March 29th of this year was not subject to Section 524B of the Act. And that's important because everything after that date is subject and will have to have had more cybersecurity documentation than anything that came before it. And if you have a device that you submitted before that time that was cleared or approved and you have a new modification of that device, you should expect to see increased scrutiny from FDA regarding cybersecurity, whether you have AI and machine learning or not, because they have the authority and they want to see improvement. It is crucial that you really document your cybersecurity very, very well. All right, with that, we're getting close to time. Naomi, thank you so much. There are so many wonderful praises in the comments about how wonderful this presentation was. So we really appreciate it. Um, and thank you to the audience. We do have one more session um, coming up and you're not gonna wanna miss it. Um, Avis from Gallon Data is gonna walk us through the role of AI, um, opportunities and challenges with regulations and trends. Um, as a reminder, Greenlight Guru has been named the number one medical QMS by G2. You can sign up for a demo today or you can use the link in the chat. Um, or you can use the link in a chat or you can go to greenlight.guru slash webinar. Um, we will have the recordings posted online for this session by end of day and we will see you back here soon. 
Thank you for inviting us to talk about this topic. I think it's really critical. Um, and uh, thank you everyone for your attention and your, your really excellent questions. Absolutely, have a great day.